2020 will go down in history as the year of COVID-19, a global pandemic that has affected us all. Death, economic destruction and isolation can be seen worldwide, not to mention the global social uprising that happened in the wake of the killing of George Floyd by police in Minneapolis and the international spotlight that shone on the Black Lives Matter movement. We look again at some of the most memorable and moving interviews of 2020. When my son was born, 32 years, over 32 years ago, I remember looking at this little baby and I started to cry. And my question was, God, what have I done? Because when I remembered what I myself had experienced um, from a little girl, the racism, I thought, how could I have brought a child in this world to experience the horrors mm. that I had encountered? So I cried and I prayed and, 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 and I wouldn't give my son up for the world. But at that time, when I looked, remembered all I had been through, I couldn't but cry. So this thing exploding right now, for me, it's not new. It's just like it's a burst of that emotional bubble. Because no matter how, over the years, I've expressed what I've gone through in terms of racism, um, it just seemed like nobody could understand. Nobody wanted to hear, nobody wanted to listen, but now it is all coming out. Bruxy, as a pastor of a predominantly white church, what are your thoughts as you hear with what uh, Pastor Bogle said and also what you're seeing in the news? Yeah, thanks, Maggie. I so agree. My heart really connects with what you're saying, Pastor Bogle. This is a moment in time that is given to us as an opportunity, and I don't want us to squander it. I don't want us to to waste uh, one breath, one drop of blood, one life. And so um, as a white man uh, pastoring a predominantly white church, I would want to call my white brothers and sisters to say, uh, don't waste a moment of this opportunity that's been given to you to to do some some hard soul searching and some hard system searching. I think sometimes people immediately, at least white folks may immediately kind of do a quick check and say, I don't sense any prejudice within me. I don't sense any racism, so we're good here. But there is, there is certainly uh, hidden things in the heart that Jesus would encourage us to not rush past, but take our time. Every single day, we're supposed to be praying, uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Jesus said in that same prayer, uh, to pray for our daily bread. So this is meant to be a daily way of praying. Every 24 hours, I'm stopping and saying, since the last time I prayed yesterday, Lord, how have I sinned? How am I holding on to unforgiveness and how do I need forgiveness? And I think there is a, a lot of learning for us as a white folk. And this is that opportunity. I wouldn't want it to rush by to help us understand that what's happening in the news is just a dramatic dramatic display of what our black brothers and sisters are telling us is their lived experience. We saw millions take to the streets around the world, including here in Canada, as many demonstrated against police brutality and racial injustice. We go now to one of my most personal interviews I've ever done in my career, an interview with my brother, Mark McCullough, who shared how he felt as a black man in the wake of George Floyd's killing. What was your reaction when you saw the video of George Floyd's death, his murder? That could have been me. Um, especially in that situation with the cop pulled the gun out at me. That could have been me. Right? Um, I lived through that a lot. I think about that a lot. Um, just having a gun pulled out on me by somebody that's supposed to be serving and protecting our community um, just because he handcuffed and threw my, my, my longtime friend of 25 years that also has no criminal record, wonderful person, polite, well-spoken, um, and just getting out of the car just to see what was going on, um, that could have easily ended up like that situation with George, right? <laughs> Thank you. 
What will it take for change to happen, Bishop Smith? You know, when you ask a question like that, I also ask a question because a lot of people have been calling in um, for justice and uh, want to see justice done. Um, my question is, what does justice look like to you? Mm. Is justice having this one officer go to prison for life? Mm. Is justice having all four of these officers executed? What does justice look like for you? What justice might look like for one person is not the same for those that have endured systemic racism for many decades, for those of us that have been hurt, for those of us that have been left behind, for those of us that haven't been counted as a person. This is deep. This, this is not just when you see uh, uh, um, people marching in the streets, it's not just about George Floyd. It's also about Laquan McDaniel, the 16 year old that was shot in the back 17 times by Officer Van Dyke. It is about Philando Castillo, it's about Jamar Clark. It's about a lot more. And we have been silent for too long. When we tell our people to leave the streets and go home, go home to what? We have gone home for too long. This is time that we let our voices be heard. I mean, I really knew nothing about your foundation until I got diagnosed and then, you know, I was reading about it and, it, you know, I just really like the, uh, the work you're doing with the research and working with the collaboration. I mean, it's really very exciting. Canadians know um, how important talk radio is coast to coast in this country. You manage uh, all nine talk radio stations across the country on talk but this is very different. You decided you need to start talking about your own conditions with Parkinson's. Why did you start that podcast? Well, it's twofold. Uh, one, I, 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 I was looking for a podcast that was from the patient perspective. And I found a lot of you know, great podcasts that were from sort of the scientific community, from researchers and from neurologists, but I, I, I wasn't hearing the voice of the person with Parkinson's. My husband and I discovered When Life Gives You Parkinson's, your podcast, uh, driving through Quebec last summer. And we were looking to just try to make sense of what was coming into our life. And it helped so much to get what I called socialization on this, to hear what you as other families were going through. Talk to us about that, about meeting the community of the disease. Uh, the community of Parkinson's is, is just really amazing. I mean, the, the people that I've encountered in my journey, I would have never met before. So I, I kind of see getting Parkinson's a little bit as a blessing because it's really opened my eyes to the wonderful people of the world. Coming up, we continue to reflect on 2020 and the moments that shaped this memorable but difficult year here on Context. As an artist, as a singer-songwriter, is it um, everything to you to give your art to God? It is important for me to always be checking in on a faith level because um, it is easy to get distracted by all the other things that surround a life in the entertainment industry. And, um, and it's hard, like it's hard. It's a merciless business. It is. And especially for a woman, I think, like a, you know, a woman who's getting, old, getting on in years. And, and, um, and so, you know, I think that that inner driving force, which comes from, comes from without and comes from within. Right. Um, and has been there now for decades, as, as my faith has grown over the years, that's what I have to return to time and time again for refreshment and to persevere. Otherwise, I would have given up men many times over. Do you think the medical sector uh, did uh, go through like the procedure in, in a right way? Well, we did question it because um, right up until the last minute uh, he was going to do it. And then on the day of the procedure, he canceled it. And uh, he did go to a rehab center and started rehab and was doing very well. And then um, 
without telling anybody, he went back to the original facility about maybe three or four weeks later and chose to do it again and did go through with it. And for us, we kind of thought if you're not sure and you're bouncing around back and forth like that, that that's something that the doctors should have taken into consideration that, you know, one minute you want to do it, the next minute you don't want to do it. And, you know, that was a concern for us. On the other hand, your sister was fighting for her life. My younger sister was dying at the time. And, you know, that was part of what made it even harder for us because, you know, she would have given anything to live and, you know, to have our uncle almost take it so lightly to choose because he was tired to end his life when she would give anything to live. You know, it was very, very hard for us. And two years later, does it get any better? I don't think so because you know his granddaughter's now married she's moved on in her career his grandsons have and you know my mother-in-law I spoke with her last night and you know she's 86 and she misses him she's known him since she was 15 years old and you know it's it's like he was like a sibling to her I don't know you know we we still wish he hadn't done it we wish he was still here with us he was a big part of our family Have you ever been hurt by the church before? Uh, yes and no. So and, uh, when you say church, it depends what you mean. As a black African, the church was like, is a big part of colonization. So I used to be a Roman Catholic. And basically, they were a big part of how I got colonized and stuff. So they kind of hurt me. But what they mean is also like helps like black people in, uh, in America, the way they could congregate and do the things in secret was also because they went to a church because that's the only place they could meet. No, I haven't. No. I wouldn't say misinformed, but confused, depending on the pastor you go to or the church. Do you currently go to church? Um, no, I don't, which is a shame, but uh, not that I can't say I'm busy. You know, you're never too busy to go to church. Yes, I do. Never. Yeah, I go to church uh, before the lockdown, but now uh, we are unable to go. It's very sad for us. Coming up, we listen to Canada's Indigenous voices and the historic land dispute between Six Nations and the Canadian government that is wreaking havoc on a small town community. To understand us as Mi'kmaq people, like we have these peace and friendship treaties mm -hmm. that were signed in the 1700s. And, and all it is, is that we have peace and friendship with each other. And that's why Canada is a diverse country. You have multi different cultures here in, in Canada. And that's part of the treaty that everybody is welcome. As long as you protect Mother Earth for seven, seven generations to come mm -hmm. and, and you respect each other's uh, laws. And, and that goes with us. So we have but unfortunately for the last hundred years since the residential school and everything, we've been put in little reserves and, mm -hmm. and you know, we faced the cycle of abuse and all that. So now we're coming out. And historically we were known as the peacekeepers. Uh, we had treaties with, with the Pope going back, with France, with Great Britain, and they're all peace and friendship treaties. Right. And all these things that we can all live in, in peace and harmony amongst each other. So it's, it's uh, for me, being a historian, like studying my histories and being brought up with it, seeing something like this, uh, having a positive um, agreement or a resolution coming to coming that way is, is very, it's good. It's very positive for us mm. because we face a lot of um, negativity. Yeah. You know, even with the murdered and missing Indigenous women, like it's hard for us to go even outside our reserve. Um, because you're of looking, the culture shock and everything. You're seeing that this is hopeful. This is a hopeful transition and a hopeful change. Definitely. Put your down and go away! Another example of uh, uh, OPP coming in here with uh, these violent acts of aggression against, uh, you know, uh, people that are just occupying their traditional territory. He blames the OPP, he blames the Ontario government, but deep down inside, this is a federal issue. And we're tired of it. 
It's known as the Six Nation of the Grand River Land Dispute. The standoff in Caledonia is taking place about 60 minutes west of Toronto and is between the Six Nations and the Canadian government, each side claiming land rights. It dates back to the 1780s and the Treaty of Paris. Six Nations claim the land is theirs in perpetuity, but it seems the land is perpetually before the courts. In the 1970s, the conflict erupted in the form of protests, blockades and occupations. And ever since, all formal negotiations have broken down between everyone involved. Up for dispute is the construction of an on-again, off-again planned subdivision. This year, the dispute once again exploded among the land defenders of the Haudenosaunee First Nations, who have joined in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en and other First Nations. And despite being ordered by an Ontario court to leave, the land defenders are refusing. For me, and what I hear people say that are in my circles that struggle with substances, is that we all feel a lack of disconnection, and now we're just missing out on this like secret of life that it seems like everyone else is just performing, like getting up at nine in the morning every day, taking care of the kids in there, just doing all these life responsibilities to like a hero degree. And we just feel like we're either like not a part of that really low, or sometimes we feel like we're better than, but there's never like a true or real connection in terms of like being equal. So we're like that sober, and just afraid most of the time. So when we take, when I drink booze or somebody else does drugs, that all those feelings go away. I never, I never plan to drink one beer. So I always plan to drink to get drunk, but if I even just try to do it for one night, I'll carry that on to the X amount of days later until I'm, I can't take it anymore. And so here we are at a Christian university, you're in, enrolled in social work program, uh, against all odds. Is that why you're getting into social work so that you cannot give up on people as well? I feel sometimes really grateful to be in a place like this because like no, no one from my family yet has like attempted to go to, to university. And where we where I grew up in Hamilton was really, I was living in poverty, barely getting the proper dinners and like on the food and stuff like that. So to be here and to be on this journey is only something I can attribute to like God's never ending faithfulness. This conflict has, you know, suddenly burst out into a full like war for the past 44 days since uh, started on September 27 and ending on November 9. And during this war, uh, 150,000 Armenians were affected. Some of them lost everything they have in their cities and towns, and some of them managed to uh, uh, take the bus ride to Armenia, which is a very, very long way. It's about 10 to 12 hours uh, by bus or car, and that's how they escaped the shelling. Uh, some of them, of course, stayed in their towns and villages, and um, many kids and moms died in a hospital in a maternity ward that was shelled, and uh, some of them refused to just re leave. They said, we will not leave our towns, we will not leave our churches, and we will stay here to defend them. So it's a very dire situation for the ones who have left and winter has started. Right. And a church has also been attacked, we hear? Yes, in the city of Shushi, uh, there was a big uh, church that we have there built about 110 years ago that was shelled and it completely, the dome was completely destroyed. Mm. And uh, that's the ironic thing about it, that uh, this church is actually older than Azerbaijan itself, because Azerbaijan became a country in 1918 only. Right. While Armenian churches and monasteries, some of them date back to the fourth and fifth century after Christ. So it's like um, people are having to leave like their heritage behind, not just their home. The war is really devastated. It's a humanitarian crisis. I think it's probably the, the worst humanitarian crisis that we've seen in, in 100 years. And uh, with anything like that, uh, it intensifies, of course, the uh, situation for Christians that are living there. Um, 
things were, were pretty bad to begin with in, in the country for all citizens, not just Christians, but for all of them. Uh, now we have uh, COVID-19 thrown in on top of that, and it's just exasperated things for people so much. Yeah. One of the problems that we're seeing in Yemen, and not only, not only in Yemen, but in other countries as well, uh, I think of countries like India and uh, Syria and other countries where, where uh, people are desperate for aid. And uh, what's, what's happening is that much of the aid that's going is being administered by local authorities and uh, religious groups and so on. Uh, Christians are already discriminated against. And now this is a, just a, another form of persecution, I would say, is uh, the withholding of aid to minority groups like Christians in, in the country. The Republican Party will remain the voice of the patriotic heroes. I'm running as a proud Democrat, but I will govern as an American president. And the masks are on or off. Either way, we're in for another wild ride with our cousins south of the border, this time with the 2020 presidential election just days away. As crazily divided the United States is anything but united, is it as the media reports? These divisions are actually not new. Um, they actually want to talk about rancorous, divisive, destructive politics. Uh, this is not something that this generation has invented. In fact, you go back to some of the early days of the American Republic, even you go back to elections in Upper and Lower Canada here north of the border. You had thuggery, you had intimidation, you had people paying bar tabs so that they could get the, you know, the right candidate to be voted, right? Uh, all the kind of stuff that, you know, if we sent in inspectors today, you know, go to an election in, uh, in Belarus, say, or something, they'd say, right. well, well, that's not right. That's electoral mismanagement or something. We had all this stuff, right? It's pretty. It's a pretty consistent theme in our history, and if we're missing it, it's because we've actually whitewashed our history. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 that I think is is one of the things that you know is being called forward, especially by movements like Black Lives Matter and other kinds of uh, uh, social justice movements. They've been drawing our attention to the fact that. You know, uh, you know, if a if a black man is beaten by a police officer and nobody's there to see it, does it still happen? Well, yes, it does. It just so happens that for the last 50 or 60 years or several hundred years, we haven't been seeing it. And now we are. So are those divisions new? I don't think those divisions are new. I think they've always been there. But for the first time, we're aware of them on a mass level. And it's causing us to confront our past together. And I actually don't think that's a bad thing. I think that is a confrontation that's overdue. Six years ago, uh, I left my church and I almost left the faith as a, as a result of it. And it was a, a really, a, a, I don't think I saw it until I was well into a very dark valley. And whereas the people in the church had hurt me, particularly the leaders, it felt as if God was against me. And it felt like for a season of time as if God was siding on their side rather than mine. And so there was this us against them, even though we were all followers of Jesus. And I think that messes with your faith a lot. And it messes with your ability to come close to God and ask him for help because you assume that he's on the side of the pastor and the elders and whoever's still in the church. And I think the only way that I have found that ends up working is that usually when you're in a really dark spot, God's light shines brightest. And just when we think it's our job to come and to God, we find out that he's the one who all along has had his grip on us and gets us out of that pit and back into a place of help. And that's what happened to me. It was God who healed me and, and brought, back, brought me back to a church and a place of help where I can actually enjoy the very things that he uh, set out to, to give us in the first place. But man, it's been a journey. What's the first step to reconciliation? Well, you know, I think uh, looking at reconciliation, you cannot have reconciliation without facing truth. And part of that truth is, you know, a very sad, sad history in our country. And so in order to move reconciliation forward, it goes back to, you know, the question you asked Chris, Chris about education. And how are we walking our next generations through this? And how are we educating today on, like you said, we're talking about the, the fisheries and Mi'kmaq fisheries. 
Uh, you know, when we look back at the treaties and, and understand that history in this country, and you know those those signatures that were applied to the treaties and and the inherent rights of of land, uh, these are conversations that because it hasn't been taught in our in our history, we have a lot of work to do. And as Chris said, it is happening. Uh, but I, I I'm always encouraged when we go and do the work that we do because it is changing. A light has been coming on. And, you know, now that our youth are coming home from school and saying, I learned this in school, parents are actually taking the initiative to to listen into to to sessions like this, to go on and do some of their own research, you know, to walk through different exercises that they can go through in learning, reading, uh, going to resources, that sort of thing. So there's there's lots of lots of ways that we can move it forward. But the truth is, is what's going to heal and move us forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chris, I want to hear how you and Kali work together to bring conversation of healing and reconciliation into different workspaces. Tell us how that, what, what that looks like today. Well, I mean, I, I think today's world, it's a, it's a very rare situation when you have a six foot two non-Indigenous man on stage with an Indigenous mother and matriarch and delivering a message that the wrongs of the past are in fact true and we need to recognize them and you get to see that from both sides of the fence so to speak i mean we both got a different lens we both have a different background and just in order to educate we can't just have one perspective when we move forward we need to have multiple perspectives and i think that's the the power of being one humanity and moving in that changing direction together. We hope you've enjoyed taking a look back at some of the issues and moments that we've covered here on Context in my first six months of joining the Context team as anchor. What a year 2020 has been. We're all using words and phrases like pivot, isolation, masks, physical and social distancing, and bubbles like never before. It has been a year fraught with so much uncertainty. But as we close the book on this chapter in history, we hope you have found moments this year not just to reflect on the things we've lost, but to be mindful of the things we have taken for granted. Family, loved ones, community the things in life that really matter, and let's face it, the things we yearn for the most. This year at Context, would it be possible without the amazing team here behind the scenes who work to make this show possible, and you, our viewers and donors, who make sure we're able to bring Christian analysis on the news. From all of us here at Context, thank you for watching. I'm Maggie John. Happy New Year. <laughs>